to set the stage, I should say I, I, I did this event uh, in London uh, last year. And while I've watched the whole microservices uh, development as a spectator, I, I, I don't write a huge amount of code these days. I, I dabble, but I don't, I don't build software for commercial sale anymore. That was my previous job. Um, so it, it, it was a little bit of an eye-opener for me to, to look at microservices through the lens of actual practitioners last year, because it, in my naive view of the world, it was like basically web services done better. Right? Now, it, it turns out um, microservices is actually a sea change. It, it, it's a, it's a catch-all for a radical transformation in the way that we develop software and systems and deliver them and maintain them. And that, for me, was the, was the moment of truth on the, on, on the Microservices Day talk last year. I was chatting to Jason Mello earlier on about how ADP is transforming their industry. And that's a, uh, an organization with 9,000 programmers worldwide. So, you know, as he said, he has his team. And I, I was thinking four or five people. And he said, no, no, 300 people. And I said, that's not a team, that's a group. So um, I, I think you're going to see throughout the day that that transformation is continuing. Microservices is here to stay, but think of microservices less as a technology and more as a, as a process transformation in the way that we deliver software. Um, I'm going to be your MC all day. Uh, sorry about that. Um, we're going to kick off with Paul Stanley. I will apologize for Richard Roger. Uh, he was supposed to be here today, but he has this thing called a business that he has to run, uh, and he was unavoidably detained with that business back in Dublin. So without further ado, let me introduce Paul Stanley, who's going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of microservices. Thank you, Paul. John, thanks. Yeah, so I, I work with your firm. Um, I have the, the, uh, the privilege of... of, of been part of some really, really cool projects over the last few years. Uh, we're probably the biggest players in Node.js from a consultancy perspective at the moment. Um, we put our first kind of production Node.js system using microservices uh, live in about February 2012. So we got about five years of, of kind of this kind of approach. Uh, back then, we were using a um, modular approach, which we now call microservice. We didn't call it microservices back then. Um, and, and we've managed to put together some fantastic projects for a whole host of companies. Wonderful. Um, and, it, and it's been great being a part of that team. Uh, essentially, when we started, we could see Node and, and what it was going to do, and we could see the, the big changes. And for us, it came down to one simple thing. Everything in the world is getting more complicated. It's getting harder to do and achieve. Things that were easy a few years ago are, are difficult. Um, and that's just more as well kicking in in reality that we deal with every day. So the systems that we developed previously to build software and get it live are just slowing down. Things were becoming big, ugly monoliths that tended to be very, very brittle. Every time you made a change, everything broke. Everything was slowing down, and there was a huge appetite to go faster, you know. And we saw some of the early people like uh, PayPal and Netflix adopt these kind of changes where you have like the technologies like Node.js and Angular and more recently React. You've got the, the architecture approaches like microservices. You've got the processes. You've got the continuous deployment. And that was enabling them to move code from developer's laptop into the production environment much more quickly. And that was the whole, that was the point of it, right? Um, uh, and and this, is, this presentation is going to be very heavy on the word why, because understanding why is the key to everything. And, and it's, it's one of the things that, that we see. We've had an awful lot of projects go really, really well. And we've had an awful lot of projects go really, really badly, because we try things and we make mistakes. And I want to share some of our things that went well and things that went badly, and just explain the why. right? Because if you don't understand the why, you can't really apply it to your own situation. So, uh, really simple, uh, why microservices at all, right? Why bother? And the simple reason is that it gives you a way to actually get software from 
developer's laptop into production safely. And I'll go through some of the detail of, of why it's safer uh, over the next little while. And I'll, I'll give you some of the techniques we've kind of developed to make it safe to do that, right? So you've got a heap of developers. Um, they're all insane, right? I used to be a developer, right? And somehow you're going to let them write code, and that code magically goes through a pipeline and appears on, on the, the, the production system, and everything is going to be fine, right? And uh, an awful lot of people try to jump out the window, even at this height, when you say that to them, if they're involved in ops in a big enterprise, right? So, um, uh, but you can't do what we're being asked to do without having things like continuous deployment pipelines in place. We, we work with companies, generally, they want to implement a CEO's initiative within about three months. They want to start up a new product line, that MVP has to be live in 10, 12 weeks. Um, to kind of converge and to deliver successfully on those kind of timescales within the complex systems we do, we have to use these, these approaches. And, and we've, had, uh, we've, we've had some fantastic wins. You know, win is where you actually manage to deliver everything on time and the customer is really happy. That doesn't mean delivering a feature set. That means delivering a system that meets the business need, which is very, very different. Um, we've seen uh, our good friend Melvin Conway in action. Um, you'll hear about that later on. It's, it's the idea that uh, when you architect and design a system, it's going to mirror the, the communication structure in your organization, right? But what we've actually seen is that it's not always just that way. That there's actually these two things are interrelated. And in some cases, we found that by changing the architecture, we've actually managed to force a change in the way that the organization works. And a couple of our customers actually deliver projects more successfully because they had to change the way they worked to meet, meet their, uh, their deadlines. And the architecture kind of propagated that change to the organization. It was a kind of a forcing function. Um, we also find as well that an awful lot of systems were built you know, in big monolithic systems, right? So it does something, right? And an awful lot of our customers have bits of that system that create value, you know? So we have a couple of people who do uh, uh, systems that do handle payments, right? In the middle, you might have a, a specific access control or risk management module, but that's in the middle, right? So if somebody wants to use that, they can't get it because it's in the middle of a big system. And we found by breaking it apart, we actually enabled uh, their, them as businesses to start exposing that functionality in a different way and open new business revenue lines. And overall, what we see is when people actually go through the, the, the process of moving away from their old system, moving on to one of these microservice-based systems, uh, you do get a better, less brittle system. Um, uh, but it hasn't been perfect, and, and we have all sorts of these, these horrible things happening. Right? So uh, I don't know, how many people here use Agile? Yeah? Really? Real Agile? Like proper Agile? <laughs> really? Ish, there we go. That's what I have written on my card, actually, Agile-ish, right? <laughs> Agile is terrible if it's applied the wrong way. So uh, most business stakeholders, Agile, very, very simple. It means that three days before you go live, you can change those requirements and everything is going to be fine, right? So that's, that's we, we get these things. Um, and we have all sorts of, of things like this, you know, um, uh, microservices kind of, you know, where you, you go halfway there and you get all the, the, do all the hard work and you get all the overhead, but you don't really get the benefit. That happens as well. Um, we also, I have a massive amount of people who don't understand that the team needs to be a single team now, that you know, you've got a, a designer and a product manager and an architect and coders back end and front end, and you've got your DevOps people, and they all need to talk to each other, and they all need to talk to the customer. And if you don't have that connection set up, it just it breaks down. Um, but, but the one I want to focus on today really is this, this other one, which is uh, the idea of, of bug-free software. So I don't know how many... How many people like to kind of, you know, deliver like zero bug software into production? That's, that's the aim, right? Yeah? How many people manage? Anyway, we can, we can talk about it later, but that's, that's really where, where we see a lot of things happen, okay? And, and the, the big question to ask today really is, you know, how, have your systems been built to fail? Do you understand what an acceptable error rate is on your system, okay? Um, and this is where it breaks down because a, a lot of the problems we see are because people are thinking and talking about software systems as if they're straightforward or even just complicated, okay? So to, to look at a kind of a system that 
is similar to the kind of cloud implementations we put together, you have to go a little bit more complicated, okay? So I'll go through this here. This is um, uh, Three Mile Island. Um, at about four o'clock in the morning on the, the 28th of March, uh, back in 1979, um, there's, there's actually two uh, reactors. Reactor one was down for maintenance. Reactor two uh, had a problem. It had a very, very major problem. Um, it, it was uh, like went into full uh, meltdown. Um, we actually had a, a proper core breach where radioactive material was leaked out. Um, it took uh, until 1993 to clean it up and it cost about a billion dollars, okay? So, so the first big thing, of course, was, there's a big report, you can read it, it's, uh, I don't know, it's a couple of hundred pages long, the government report, it's fantastic reading. But, you know, we need to stop this happening again, so we need to figure out what was the root cause, okay? So, what do we do? Well, okay, so let's look at it. And this is where it's really like a lot of the systems that we do. How many architecture diagrams have you drawn that make things look straightforward? This is the architecture, right? Okay, really, really simple, right? Radioactive material creates heat. Primary cooling system pulls that out, tends to get a bit reactive, so it has to be transferred into a secondary cooling system, which converts water into steam and drives a turbine, right? Okay, simple, easy. I don't know how they could get it wrong, right? And the, the simple fact of the matter is that absolutely this is, this is it. And the simplified schematics actually show you that it is this simple, but the implementation is not simple at all. The complexity underneath is, is there. And you can see that in, in our systems as well. Uh, if you looked up, I loved it, it was a tweet a couple of weeks ago from a guy who was talking about one simple flow for a single notification message, which was like 1,000 to the corner of their system. It's like this big complicated diagram. And this is the same with, with a, a nuclear reactor, you've got a lot of problems underneath, right? So it's, it's kind of a problem if they go wrong because they tend to be near population centers. This one was actually just down the road in uh, Long Island. Does it, who's heard of this incident, by the way? I assume you all know it, right? Mostly, yeah, perfect, okay, it's great. <clears throat> so, all fantastic, all brilliant, simple. You get the next level down and you have to have like massive amounts of redundancy. You have to have fail systems, you have to have safety systems. The safety systems also don't, don't need to work all the time. So they just sit there unused most of the time because it's normal operation. And then when something goes wrong, they kick in, right? But that in itself lends, makes it even more complex. So, uh, so they had a, had a quick check through what went wrong on the day. Um, it was actually two or three fairly big, simple things and a load of different things going wrong. So uh, they, they have to clean this resin stuff, this uh, uh, polisher out of the system. They use it with high pressurized air normally. That, that, the day before, they had failed to get it all out with the air. They could see they hadn't cleaned it, so they just pushed it through with water. That water then pushed some of that resin into um, a, a, one of the air instruments, right? So it just, just blocked it a little bit, right? That problem compounded itself until about four o'clock in the morning, the air pressure started to fail because of that bit of resin stuck, right? And then they basically started shutting off the secondary cooling systems. Now, uh, that's a bit of a challenge, really, because it kind of tends to get very hot near the reactor if you don't have a secondary cooling system pulling the, the heat out, okay? Um, and then all sorts of things started to go wrong. So it turns out that they had been doing some maintenance on the backup pumps, and they had closed the valves, but they hadn't opened them again. Now, that's technically a breach of protocol, but well, that's the way it was, right? They make mistakes. So... The water stopped, the secondary system stopped, the backup systems failed, and then you start having heat exchange with the, the primary coolant stops. And I think it's, it's about seven seconds into this incident where things start to get fairly dangerous. So what happens then is you get control rods dropping into your reactor core. They absorb kind of the reaction going on in there and they shut everything down. That's the, that's the idea. Um, the challenge, and, and they did drop, and that, that was great, uh, but the problem is the heat was still building up, right? Heat builds up, and then the pressure valve releases, right? The pressure valve at the top, which is what you want, brilliant. But when it finishes letting all this pressure out, it didn't close again, right? And 
the, the indicator, so the guys in the, in the control room are looking at it and the, the indicator goes green again. Now, uh, as, as a, an engineer, these indicators are based off of whether the solenoid is active or not. So there's a little uh, magnet, electromagnet that just pulls the valve shut. Yeah, there was power to the solenoid, but the actual valve itself was stuck open. So the green on the instrument light didn't actually indicate that the valve was shut. So you've got this massive problem. Um, and now what you, you've got then is you've got essentially, it, it's what they call a, a loss of coolant accident. It's, it's how they describe these incidents when it, something goes into meltdown, right? That's 13 seconds, right? So it's, it's not really much time for a human to intervene or, or stop things going wrong, right? Uh, anyway, all sorts of, and then all sorts of things start, continue to go wrong. So, um, the, the, um, uh, I guess the, the incident starts about 4 a.m. By about 8 a.m., they currently reckoned that they'd actually melted down half of the uranium in the whole reactor, okay? They had a poor reactor breach. That valve was actually pumping a radioactive active isotope out. So this is where it's, it's kind of, it's nasty, right? When they actually analyzed exactly how and why it went wrong, there's all sorts of little root causes, but the basic cause is it's such a complex system with so many inter interdependencies that you can't keep it 100% safe. And it's just, it's gonna fail every now and then, and it failed that morning. They were able to zero in a couple of things, right? For instance, the, the, the big breach around the, um, the backup pumps not being actually, the valves being shut, right? So they brought in special protocols to double check that with checklists and the whole lot, which is exactly what we do in software, right? If things were failing in one part of the system. And then they checked four years later and the error rate, how often those pumps were, those valves were closed when they should be open was exactly the same. So it's not really, when you've got a complex system, you have to deal with errors, okay? So the question is, how do we deal with it? How do we manage the risk? How do we get, in our case, software into production safely, okay? So uh, this is a probability of failure. A little bit of maths now for a short while. So what you have basically is you've got two components here. Um, you would imagine that for any particular microservice you're putting into production, a 1% failure rate would be reasonably good, right? Okay, it sounds quite good. And then if you put two microservices, two components live in a system, and this, this is actually the same for components in a monolith as well, by the way, so it's the same kind of maths will apply. You're, you're suddenly up kind of one in 50 might fail, okay? And this is where it gets really, really nasty because as you increase the number of components, the probability starts to rise in a certain way. So I don't know, how many people here have a system with less than 100 components? Less than 100 components in your entire system? Huh? Um, yeah, yeah, how many? Who runs off microservices? How many microservices would you have? A dozen. A dozen? Well, Brilliant, okay. So you're somewhere about here. So about kind of 15% of the time. Um, it depends, if you, if you go as far as say uh, the Guild Group have, they have what, two and a half thousand now? I don't know, anyway. But basically, if you, if you have this many components and if you've got only that many microservices, what you'll find is inside those microservices are actually, uh, there's a number of components that are dependent on each other. You suddenly get to the point where you're more likely to have a failure when you deploy. And that's, that's a lot of the reasons where people who deploy in cycles, and very, very rarely, regularly have massive problems, okay? The mats are working against you. And Software is not like building nuclear reactors, right? So one of the things you can have in nuclear reactors is you can make multiple valves. If one of them is stuck, another one will go. Everything is good. In software, defects get propagated. Redundancy doesn't really help you at all, okay? So what we've gone from was a system where uh, 
way back in the day, if you go back far enough, systems were really, really simple. So you could do a nice traditional release and you could effectively get to a zero bug count and you could deploy and everything would be fine. And now our systems look a bit like this. This is a schematic of uh, uh, Three Mile Island Reactor 2, the simplified system. Again, once you're changing a lot of components, it's going to go wrong. You're going to have failures. So how do you avoid that? Well, what we like to do is to look at different systems. So um, the, the analogies we use actually really, really causes problems, right? When you talk about microservices, I hear people talking a lot of times about building a building, you know, and each, each uh, service is a building block, and microservices, we can wrap them in cellophane so we can pull one out and put another one back in, and the building still doesn't fall down, and it's all good. You know, or, or they're like Lego building blocks and components. And the, the thing about Lego and, and building with building blocks is that you've got a lovely small subset of physics that governs that, okay? If your block is strong enough to hold itself and a couple of blocks over it, your building is not going to fall down. Great. Software systems are actually very, very uh, complex in the way that they're interdependent, okay? So they're much more like a living system. And living systems actually don't try and do uh, error-free deployments. This is uh, mitosis. It's cell division, right? Okay? It, it fails all the time, everywhere. Uh, we call it mutation. We make really cool films about it. You know, it's, there's an acceptable error rate. There has to be. You, it can't be gotten right. Okay? It also has a fantastic mechanism for sorting out the problems, right? But we can't really rely on evolution. We don't have that kind of time scale when you're deploying software. So, so what we do is kind of cope with it is deploy often, deploy little, little bits. So what you want to move is you want to move from where you're deploying multiple components and your, your probability starts working against you, where you're actually literally getting one microservice, that change, live, okay? And, you know, this is, this is um, you know, if you look back to uh, Netflix in 2008, they had like four days of an outage because they couldn't, their systems are too tangled, you know? We had a, a bank in, in Ireland that went down for a week, which was just incredibly bad. And this is prompting a lot of those organizations to move to microservices exactly for this reason, because you can keep deployment small, keep, keep them safe. Um, but we regularly find, actually, that this word safe is a very objective thing. So what we generally have in the organizations is we have somebody who's been around a very, very long time who kind of has to figure out whether it's safe to deploy or not. Um, this is a, a poker hand. It's a pretty good poker hand. It's not the best, okay? You don't have to have a royal flush to bet. It has to be good enough, right, okay? So mm, would you bet on a four or five, I don't know, normally, yeah. So how good does the software release have to be? How will you know whether you can bet on being okay in production? Is it safe to go on? You know, and you've got to make this call. And what we find in a lot of organizations, this tends to be like this weird uh, meeting that happens. It's like a go, no, go meeting with a couple of people in a room, and they kind of agree, you know, well, it, we didn't really meet any of our objectives in terms of getting it to zero bugs, but it's good enough. Let's go with it. And it's kind of relying on intuition. Um, so what we like to do is just put a bit more science behind it. So, um, so first of all, anyway, deploy one component at a time. Um, I don't know whether you, you know your deployment patterns. Does everybody know deployment patterns? Just skip this bit if they do. This is the canary, so really, really simple. You start, you bring in one instance, a new one, and if it breaks, you roll it back out so that you don't get very many errors. If it works, then you start rolling in more until you've completely replaced your old microservice version. Nice and simple. Um, I love the bake pattern. It's, it, again, it makes it safer. It's, it's, uh, it's where you, you deploy your, your microservice and you route live traffic to it and you measure the outcomes. And if the outcomes are the same, then you can actually start moving more and more onto your version 2.0 of, 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 of this instance. Um, so there's ways of doing it. This is the way uh, uh, GitHub, I think, managed. They call it baking it in. They manage their, uh, the access control stuff that they deploy like this. So, um, but the thing is, how do you know if it's safe? So what we have actually in the, in the pipeline is you've got a series of discrete steps, each of which you can, you can build a confidence interval around in terms of the probability of it being okay to deploy. So, you know, it might be that, um, you know, all my unit tests are, are okay. That's like good. So one out of 10 times I'm going to be okay. You know, 
the basic system tests run, or the pre-commit hooks or whatever it is, maybe one third of the time I'm going to be okay. A full integration test runs great, 75%. You know, so, and you slowly get more and more confident that the software that you, is going through your deployment pipeline is actually fit for purpose and is not going to destroy the world once it gets into the live, live environment. So using this as a risk measurement device is actually a very, very, we found it to be fairly effective. So um, this is Bayes' theorem. It's horrible maths, right? Ridiculously complicated, completely unnecessary, OK? But your brain runs on probability theorems all the time. That's why people who supposedly aren't good at maths are really, really good card players. They're working out massive probability problems all the time, right? So use your head and take a guess. Whoop. Let's try that again. Yeah, so take a guess. So what we say is, right, OK, let's take a look at your pipeline, OK? Break it down. Score it up in terms of, you know, well, this is the number of unit tests I have. This is the number that are passing. You normalize it. And then you can actually weight the different parts of your pipeline because some of them are more meaningful than others, right? I mean, a unit test isn't particularly good. A full system test or a load test shows you that you're in pretty good shape, maybe. And what you can do is you can actually start building up a number that says, this is how co confident I am that this software is going to be safe, OK? And if you've got the criteria right, you're, um, uh, you're going to be able to iterate on this and hone it and make it better and better over time. So you actually figure out automatically the software can diagnose and measure itself and figure out whether or not you're in the right place, whether or not it's safe to take the next step. Anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a it's an interesting exercise. Um, it'll take us about two years before we'll know exactly whether it's 100%, but the early results are good. Um, and it's all about just figuring out you know, whether the numbers are, are right or not. You know? Because as this, uh, Richard Feynman says, nature can't be fooled. Um, in Challenger, the, one of the rings failed. Uh, NASA had a number of uh, 1 in 10, 100,000 did fail. But it turns out if you're actually at zero degrees, which it was zero degrees the morning Challenger launched, uh, 1 in 100 of those rings will fail. So don't try and fool nature. Measure. Measure everything. Figure out how good your software is, how safe it is. And hopefully then you can actually get it into the production without destroying the world. Uh, and this is because I promised Richard I'd plug his book. Uh, so this is his, his new book, The Tell Microservices. Hopefully most of you will uh, get a look at it over the next little while. And uh, if you want to get me, I'm Paul at your forum. OK. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Paul. And of course, it is Paul Savage, not Paul Stanley. Paul Stanley is a guy I was in college with about 20 years ago. I do have no idea why that name popped in. Um, I, I, I love that idea of statistical analysis. Uh, I was terrible at statistics in college, and I, it's the one subject I regret not really grasping. I failed statistics three times. Um, we're really bad at statistics. Uh, in fact, um, uh, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky wrote a book, or Daniel wrote a book on it and won a Nobel Prize on how bad we are at statistics called thinking fast and slow and about all the fallacies we create for ourselves. And I recommend everybody in this room reads that book.